Hi folks, it's good to be with you. This is Jason Burns and I'm doing a public lecture on preaching. And I'm going to go through a lecture that I've given on Bollard Preachers called Homiletics. And um, this is uh, on preaching. It's an academic lecture. So we're looking at a variety of books and uh, this lecture will help you to think through your own preaching and your preaching ministry. Uh, like I said, it's a more of an academic lecture. It'll be a little bit dry because we're looking at various academic books. Uh, but I hope that uh, we'll um, branch off from the academic more into discussing preaching from one preacher to another. Uh, so let's come before the Lord. Lord, we thank you for this day and we give you the prayers and the glory. And Father, we pray that you be with us now and that you will bless. And uh, Father God, this lecture would be for your glory and will be a blessing to your preachers, Lord, in your name and for your glory. Amen. Okay. I hope uh, everybody is settled and uh, ready. I hope everybody is uh, settled and ready. And the question that what we're dealing with is which uh, preaching model is the best to use today in the light of the way adults learn. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a variety of books. For example, what is preaching? How do adults learn? Uh, then we're going to look at J.D. Adams and Lewis. Then we're going to look at P. Adams and Gilmore. Then we're going to look at the Master's Faculty and Johnson. Then we're going to have final reflections, then a comparison with what is called the Vox Report, and then final conclusions. So number one, uh, introduction. It is my hope in this lecture to first define what preaching is. I hope to do this from many sources, giving the Christian community a chance to define the subject from this definition. I hope to look at learning methods, then see how adults learn, and then I wish to contrast preaching definition with the learning models so that I can see if the learning models are relevant to preaching. This will give both homiletics and the learning models much more integrity, and this will provide a better platform for critical dialogue, basically because it stops one discipline imposing its conceptual framework on the other. Just an aside, that why I said this in my lecture, is you often hear uh, people say, well, preaching's not relevant today because of the new psychological ways of learning. Uh, people learn by doing action rather than actually listening. So what I'm saying here is that we can learn from those things, psychology, but also theology has its domain, and I think many people today forget that. So I'm making sure that the Bible is given full authority um, in this debate and discussion about what preaching is. I mean, at the end of the day, if it's in the Bible, that should settle it for any believer. Um, it, as I put here in my lecture, how easy it would be to jump into the lecture using education models to critique preaching models, who fail to test educational models themselves under critical inquiry. No, new, no ideas will be sacred, all will be tested. Now notice I say all. The reason I say that is, again, too often those who are writing books on preaching don't want their own ideas criticized because often these are academics who have new psychological understandings of learning, new uh, sociological understandings of learning, and they try to impose that on the theology. But we as theologians have a right, and as preachers and pastors, to critique their work. So I go on. I hope then to critique with such preaching models, comparing them in the light of each other, and sifting them in the light of the new learning methods. Then I wish to compare my findings with the Vox report, that is a, uh, a report from new psychological learning methods. Asking the question, why do I agree or disagree with the recommendation? Finally, I hope to give my reasons for the preaching model I think is the best to use for today. I have chosen this process because I want to maximize critical dialogue and to interact into a spiral, reflective, open thinking. But just between the lines between me and you, at the end of the day, as far as an academic should be concerned, if the Bible says it, that should be it. 
if there's any theologian out there who is a theologian, you have absolutely no right to be teaching anything in your seminary unless it's rooted on the Bible, unless you see the Bible as authority. If you as an academic see the Bible as something you can pick and mix, some, fix, some bits you don't think is the Word of God, some bits you do, then all I can say to you as an academic who claims to be a theologian, you need to pack it in and go and do another job. The only people who should be teaching in a seminary are those who believe in the full inspiration of the Bible. And that's that. End of story. No argument. No debate. Go home. If, you're, if you don't believe, as an academic theologian, if you don't believe the Bible is the Word of God, then you should be sacked and sacked today. And you're damaging preachers' lives. And you as preachers out there who preach the Word of God, you should never be intimidated by any theologian who comes to you, whether it be in a book or whether it be in a lecture, and tells you that you have to swallow their lectures, their ideas, if it's not based on the Word of God. You can turn around to them and say, no, you might have a big, big reputation in the academic world. You might be a big cheese in the academic world. But as far as God's concerned, you're a nobody. Because God does not reckon with men. God is God and he'll answer to himself. And how dare you, as a theologian, tell your students, or you pastors, tell your students that you can take it or leave it with the Bible. No, no, no. The Bible is authoritative. The Bible is is ultimately more authoritative than any science, whether it be psychology or sociology. And so we stand on the Word of God. It says that the Word of God is abiding. It says that it, the Word of God is a lamp to our feet. And so the Word of God is central to our academic life, to our pastoral ministry, and to the preaching and proclamation of the Word. This is a lecture, but from time to time, forgive me if I preach. Part one, what is preaching? It seems to me that preaching by all sections of the Christian community has a number of key elements. Preaching does not invent new ideas, but proclaims the Bible. This is in John Stott, Preacher's Portrait. It is a spiritual activity. This means that a person's preaching must be in communion with God. Stott in Preaching's Portrait. This means the, uh, the, the, the person's preaching must be in communion with God. Also, preaching considers the listeners. You don't just hurl text at people, but consider what they are thinking and how best to communicate to the level of your listeners. John, Spot, John Stott clearly explains, although we must not overstate our congregation's intellectual capacity, we must treat them as real people with real questions that we grapple in our sermons with real issues, building bridges in a real world, end of quote. Stop, I believe in preaching, page 137. Not only is preaching to be relevant, but it must be careful not to peddle the political or social theories of the day. Preaching is also authoritative. This means the preacher has an authoritative message to proclaim. For Scyther Morgan believed this ever so strongly. A sermon is not a dialogue, but a monologue. Morgan elaborates here. Preaching is the declaration of the grace of God to human need on the authority of the throne of God, and it demands on the part of those who hear that they show obedience to what they declare. So we're, we're preachers of grace. We're, we're not messing about here. Anyhow, um, Morgan again, page 16 in his book, Preaching. When preaching becomes merely discussion in the realm of the intellect, or forgive my use of the word fooling in the realm of emotion, and when preaching ends in the intellectual or emotional, it fails. End, end of quote. How is this message received? It must be sought in a humble study of the Bible without submission to the Bible as God's word. You will not find the Bible's true meaning. Prayer is important, for without God teaching the word again, you will miss the meaning of the text. The preacher also knows that the Holy Spirit teaches the word, so without his help, you can't 
do the task of extracting the message. You see, my friend, it's all about submitting to the Word of God in prayer and hum humility and independence of the Holy Spirit. And that is why many of the academic institutions in the, around the world today uh, who are teaching people to preach are failing because they do not teach their people to be humble, they do not teach their people to pray, they do not teach their people to depend on the Holy Spirit when they're studying the Word of God. How many theologians in the academic world today are proud of their PhDs, proud of their academic reputation? How many of them are walking in humility? How many theological students are walking in humility? But how easily it is to become proud of your academic achievement and not pray for the help of God to understand the word, not depend on the Holy Spirit. And that is why we see great institutions like Princeton Theological Seminary in the 1930s, which was a seminary rooted in the word of God. That's how we saw that seminary slide into liberalism because people began to be proud and they were not prayerful, they were not humble, and they didn't depend on the Holy Spirit to teach the st students about the Word of God. Now the material gained should be for a preacher of the Bible. Study must then be arranged in logical order. Once you've studied the Bible, bring your material into a logical order. You see this when you look at Bath sermons. I, I don't believe Bath's theology. But if you look at Bath's sermons, they flow so logically from exposition. Now, he was not a great expositor. Just this, this is a little aside for you uh, preachers and pastors out there. He was not a, uh, uh, an inerrantist. And, you know, there's an anathema on anybody who doesn't believe the Bible is the word of God. And, you know, he might have been a great theologian, Calvard, but he certainly was not uh, a man of the word. Because at the end of the day, he was not an inerrantist. But if you look at his sermons, you will find they are logical, they, they do are expository, they have illustration and they have application. Preaching is also to be pastoral, which means it must consider people's spiritual needs. Time and again, people, academics can preach and pastors preach, but they fail to understand where people are at and where their congregation are at. Paulinson warns how preaching in the past has made this mistake. He writes, quote, suffice it to say the church is still feeling the effects of over a century of, neglect, of neglecting pastoral counseling of the dynamic, dynamics of the changing times during this time. Secular and modern counseling systems were created, developed and become enculturated and institutionalized. And orthodoxy's redefined, refined systematic theology addresses all battles that staked out the faith in 4th, 5th, 12th, and 16th, the 17th, and 19th century. Now, end of quote. I, I got to take issue with that quote. I have to take issue with that quote. Um, I have to take issue with that quote. Paul Inson, the call of the hour in the ministry of the word, Presbyterian and Reformed Publishing. I think that quote is, is semi-accurate. The church is going into counseling at the present time, and that is because it's lost its belief in preaching. And that is a great serious problem. But at the same time, it is true that many pastors today are not practical and they don't realize the spiritual needs of their people. It is true that some pastors in the past can be too theological and thinking about old historical battles theology and forget the needs of the time and so I would say you have to have a balance you cannot do theology you cannot be a preacher unless you know what's happened in the past but you also need to be a person who knows what's going on in the present and so you need one two feet you need a foot in history and a foot in the present day to understand what's going on preaching is also doctrinal many of the books on preacher today make this point. For example, William warns the church is losing its theological bearings. Ratzinger, I don't agree with Ratzinger, but Ratzinger uh, as a theologian, being a Catholic theologian, but Ratzinger teaches that sermons must have theology in them, and he follows this up by showing how the doctrine of discipleship can be taught. Kaiser, who's a good writer, warns that preaching needs to be 
to use Old Testament theology. And Raymond warns, uh, Raymond, the God Center preacher uh, in Christian Focus 2003, Raymond warns preachers are not as theologically literate as they should be. Cap Hill warns against using stories so much the preacher then forgets to teach doctrine. Some have even called for specific doctrines to be taught, such as judgment. Some theologians have simply stated the church and preaching is in crisis because there is no interest in theology, and I would agree with that. That uh, uh, John Murray's Collected Writings, Volume 1, Banner of Truth, Edinburgh, uh, 1976, page 365, etc. Uh, Wells, No Place for True, Erdman's Grand Rapids, 1993, page 293. Excellent book, by the way. Uh, Wells, No Place for Truth, Erdman's Grand Rapids, 1993, page uh, 292. Uh, White, the effective pastor, Christian Focus, two, two thousand, uh, year two thousand, page fifty-seven. Excellent book, by the way, on preaching, uh, pastoring and preaching. There. Anyhow, quote, uh, pay, uh, yeah, Hart, uh, the ministry of the word, Presbyterian and Reform Publishing, page one eighty-seven. Here's the quote. Remember this: at least the things which the world is now interested in are things that have been. Are seen, but the things that are seen are temporal, and the things that are not seen are eternal. You, as a minister of Christ, are called to deal with unseen things. You are stewards of the mysteries of God. You alone can lead men by the proclamation of God's word out of the ca crash and jazz and noise and rattle and shake of this weary age into the green waters. You alone, as ministers of reconciliation, can give what the world, with all its boasting and pride, can never gain. The infinite sweetness of the communal of the redeemed soul with the living God. End of quote. How true. The general idea of the proclamation of God's truth in Christ in the consulting of a variety of texts from Methodist, Anglican, Catholic and Reformed writers I have pointed out the general picture of the Christian community's idea on preaching. This was very important, as I felt that preaching models could easily be squeezed into the expectation of the ex educational models. But now I have given the Christian community a voice. Basically, what I've done there, what, what I've done is I've collected a whole variety of books and articles from theologians of every persuasion and really just shown the academic world, the, the need to listen to the church and to hear what the church believes about preaching. And the church should believe what the Bible teaches and the Bible has a clear understanding of what preaching is. Now, let us consider our contemporary scene and how do adults learn in part two. We have looked... We have looked at... Uh, how the church should understand preaching. We've looked at that. Now we're going to look at new learning methods. How do adults learn? We're going to look at three models. Whole. Whole. What prevents Christian adults from learning? SCM. In his book on adult learning, Hull first talks about modernity in Christian education. He notes that the adult mind has undergone a radical cultural shift from the 1960s, a cultural shift to secularization. This has led most adults into a deep cynicism against Christianity. Adults now think that religion is only for children. Hall then goes on to talk about those in the church. He believes that the secular culture and church culture have drifted apart, and Hall strongly believes that the church cannot afford to ignore the monolithic power of modernity. Modernity has a trend to individualization, and if the people are to learn, the church must not squash individualism. Also, if you are going to get people in the church to think one must pinpoint the era that the church struggles with and use that as a breakthrough into new thinking. This is called experience of the distraction. All then goes on to make an excellent point about the history of education. He notes there have been two main types of education, one in the Hellenistic view. This is a desire to see personal, social and intellectual development. This is how to learn this as this had a, a, a learning to develop specific vocational skills. The next view was the Jewish education style, and this was devoted to the expo exposition, memorization, and application of the Torah. To have no new ideas was a virtue for this style. Hall thinks that 
the church should adopt the Greek method of education. Hall now moves on to make the point that we live in a multicultural society and the dogmatism of one God theology is not the best way to teach. Hall considers that church must recognize the pluralism of the times, preaching then must be in the Greek style and must recognize adults learning best having a pluralistic outlook. Hall then goes on to advocate hermeneutical circle of learning, and this means adults grow in understanding the wider the reference point becomes. Learners then must be taught to peel back the layers of ideology that go behind a text, and this method frees the learner from any absolutist ideological system. The next issue Hall raises is that religion's learners have a need to be right. This need to be right is because adults have a fear to be wrong. It is important to confront the learner, he says, with a cognitive dissonance experience. What all means is, a preacher, you must realize every person has inconsistencies in their beliefs. Then you must realize humans need dogmatism. Realize that humans need dogmatism and they will hold to it at all costs, even if wrong. But a preacher must show the learner that it is not a healthy thing to be like this. All explains how you can challenge people. Quote, this leads us to the possibility of deliberately setting up situations of cognitive dissonance in order to challenge complacent assumptions and stimulate inquiry. End of quote. Whole page 99. Quote, it cannot escape the attention of the adult religious educator that both Socrates and Jesus made use of direct conflict in their teaching. Socrates used questions to gradually destroy the limited concepts of his hearers while Jesus used stories to undermine the limited image of those who heard him. End of quote. Hull goes, only, goes on to say that no religious educator can ignore the special sciences, least of all can we afford to ignore Freud. Hull thinks you must recognize that a person's present experience of God is influenced by their childhood. Adults will always interpret religious experience in terms of their childhood knowing this education. Knowing this, educators must then go on to ask some important questions. For example, is the person's experience based on immature or mature childhood development? Hull gives detail to this complex issue. He notes that Freud believed the self is always interacting with the ego and superego, uh, two structures in the self. These structures respond to the father and do, do this in different ways. The ego identifies with the actual father and the superego with the transformation with the real father. What this means in practice is the learner can use religion as a defense mechanism to shield the self. Also that a person's religious experience might be in, uh, due to unhealthy relationships with either mother or father. This means that there is a need for pastoral preaching which understands where each person is at mentally uh, and, and aim at the emotional need. Now I disagree with all this by simply this, that a truth is not relative. The Bible is authoritative. The Bible is the Word of God. So you cannot advocate relativism in your preaching. That's nonsense. Secondly, the ideas of Freud are outdated. So we have to look at whole with very critical eyes indeed. American writers. The next book I, I want to suggest was a collection of essays by a group of American educationists. All these essays were stimulating and informative, and I'll give a brief synopsis of their ideas. The first writer of note to make me think is Seymour. He faces the question of how to teach people to connect their faith into the real world, and he points to the early church and notes the church taught its people through fellowship, worship, the home, and theological colleges. Seymour mapping Christian education. In more modern times, Catholics have used schools, the image have used communities as mediums to teach. He then notes that in contemporary educational theory five themes have emerged from the Christian debate. Number one, religious instruction. Number two, faith community. Number three, development. Number four, liberation. Number five, interpretation. And he explains these key terms, quote, we saw these as alternative filters shaping the field, instruction, emphasizing the structures of formal education, an ordered learning within the church, the faith community captured the power of the life of the congregation to teach development built upon psychological research about individual growth. Liberation grew out of the efforts of Latin American liberation theologies to empower people to live the, re the religion of God in the midst of oppression and interpretation focused on the ways education connected faith in everyday life. See more, page 15. 
Seymour goes on to say that our culture today feels tremendous anxiety that people in the church wonder if faith has answers and people feel the suffering in the world. It's in this context the church and preachers should feel far to feel far and reach out to it, the hurting world. Educators must in, in the midst of this anxiety point the way to the idea that history as hope has possibility. Hope in the recognition of brokenness and the possibility of transformation. In this context, we must teach people to appreciate the tradition and interacting community. This is achieved through critical reflection. I just want to note here that it's interesting the educator is really supplanting what the Bible's saying. The Bible gives you a message that you have to preach, and what this educator is saying is saying, no, I want this message to be preached. However, it's important this educator notice the need to think about where the world's coming from, and this is important as preachers. We need to scratch where it hurts. When we're preaching the Word of God, we need to see where they're coming from as a world. Uh, Shipani uses practical models to make his point, and he tells the story of a case study. It is a story about a church which was started to solve racial tension, and the church used over 10 learning methods from small group work to start into a joint choir. For Shapini, the church must be grounded in theological view of social justice. One way to do this is providing partnership in communities where people experience human emergence. Shapini believes this is a generous invitation to the congregation to partnership. This education is in the epistemology of the poor. This method provides a vocation for focusing people's lives in the service of God, love of neighbor, and the care of the world. In this process, the church becomes more human as it participates in the world. Preachers, preachers must be aware that this has been a successful way of teaching people and must grapple with these social issues. Gorman suggests that parishes are best educated by meeting in small groups and should be made to reflect on the social changes and realities of the day. He reflects on how Latin American models of education can be implemented in America and he thinks that the small group idea transcend each learning self-centeredness. If small groups gather, they must reflect on social transformation. This is because such a process produces humanness. Again, the social dimension, learnings have been emphasized and preaching must take note of this. I think the practical application of this is this, is that what this educator is saying is saying, look, when people get together as a community, that enhances uh, preaching and I think that that is true but I think that the it's the it's not just the dialogue it, it, it's the communion together that is vital I think this is my thinking that when we preach the Word of God God dwells with us as a people and we can feel God's presence and we're in communion with God and there are preachers today that preach and then everybody splits up into groups and discusses. But I think the problem with that is this. It fails to engage in worship. And preaching is about worship. It's about communing with God as a people. And so I would take some issue with that educator. Postmodernism. One of the main factors which influence people in the way they learn is postmodernism. Postmodernism believes that there are no absolutes. This means that there is a reluctance to think in terms of absolute truth. Postmodernism affects the way people explore text, especially religious books. It profoundly questions any authority for any text, and we see this explained by the high priest of postmodernism, the philosopher Derrida, and his disciples, and countless biblical scholars who have put his ideas into practice in their educational establishments. Here are two examples of postmodernism thinking. One from Derrida, the other a postmodern Bible scholar. These examples illustrate some of the profound problems a preacher needs to think about in terms of postmodernism. Quote, Derrida writing indifference. But within this, <coughs> quote, Derrida, but within this movement of succession, writing keeps its vigil between God and God, between the book and the book, and if writing takes shape on the basis of both this vigil and beyond of the closure, that the return to the book does not enclose us within the book. What a complete gobbledygook that was. End of quote. Next one. Akel, the Postmodern Bible, Yale University, page 3. Yale University Press. Quote, 
That is by sweeping away secular notions of meaning by radically calling into question the apparently stable functions of meaning on which traditional text and interpretation is situated. By raising doubts about the capacity to achieve ultimate clarity about the meaning of a text, postmodern readers lay bare the contingent and constructed character of meaning itself. End of quote. This postmodern atmosphere is everywhere and cannot be ignored. From the days of Nietzsche, who questioned the authority, uh, Nietzsche, Beyond Good and Evil, Penguin Classics, page 53, who questioned all authority, to Popper, who turns classic scientific theory on its head with his idea that you do not need facts to prove a theory, this is a blow to postmodernism and tr to traditional ways of thinking. Nagel, Karl Popper, the concise encyclopedia of Western philosophy, Unwin, Oxford, 1982, page 253. Mm -mm. People today at all levels of education, whether it be religious education or a scientific, have an inbuilt bias against authoritarian models of learning. This is a precisely the conclusion the Jewish-German intellectual Hannah Arden came to. Arden to the portable Hannah Arden Penguin Books, page 438. How do these learning models relate to the Christian communication general concept of preaching? First of all, I clearly are clearly on reflection that the learning models and the preaching definition are biased to a particular point of view, i.e. the biblical point of view, a particular way of seeing reality, i.e. the biblical reality. For example, Hall seems to use negative terms to describe religious people, making general, uh, sorry, the educational models are also biased, uh, looking at it from sociological and political and philosophical biases. For example, Hall seems to use the negative terms to describe religious people making general statements, such as religious people are dogmatists, they do not think at all, etc. Because he is using psychology, he assumes his statements are objective, but often they are subjective statements. For example, he uses concerning Freud and Jung's concepts. These men were not scientific in their procedures, but produced their theories from personal reflection. Uh, Jung used his dreams as a, a basis for his theories of adult learning, so Hull speaks not with objective data but subjective theory of psychology has often been guilty of being prejudiced about religion, and I think because Hull's used psychology, he unwittingly adopts these prejudices. One prejudice is that religious people are stuck in their ways and need to change. The American writers fall into the trap of uh, in using their way of seeing reality as a, a paradigm to their educational theories. All three writers acknowledge they are influenced by liberation theological agendas, and their educational models are shaped to fit this liberation agenda. Then postmodern way of thinking, though it describes the way people think today behind postmodernism, a view about one way of looking at reality. This is to see reality in terms of relativism. Finally, I see how many how my preaching model is is clearly biblical as opposed to these learning models. Having looked at the American writers, I see that the Christian understanding of preaching um, is much, much in line with the Bible than with these modern methods of understanding. Um, In my reflection, I think I can pull out seven good reasons of how people learn here. People learn with a secular mind and filter information. We've got to understand that people do not think Bible. And so we've got to realize that when we're preaching the Bible, we're preaching to people who don't think Bible. So we've got to think, how do we get that Bible into their minds as a preacher? Number two, people learn from a multicultural mindset. In other words, people like to be broad-minded. So we've got to maybe use illustrations from different cultures, different societies to bring people into the Word of God. Three, people learn through a hermeneutical circle. In other words, they're not going to get it straight away. So you've got to just keep plugging away and plugging away in your preaching. Number four. We need to have cognitive dissonance, that is to say, turn the tables, turn the prejudice of the people in your preaching. Preach, and as you're preaching, 
challenge prejudice that they have and turn it upside down. Next, number five, people are influenced and developed emotionally, intellectually because of childhood experiences. In your preaching, use illustrations from childhood. I think that will have an impact on people. Number six, people learn well through being taught and involved in social transformation. Encourage people to go to a local church or when you're preaching, encourage them to come together and talk about what they've learned after the service. People learn through a postmodern paradigm. Now, it's important in this postmodern issue, just to reflect on postmodernism a, a minute. Postmodernism is a very negative, it's a negative thing and it's a positive thing. Postmodernism from a Christian perspective is negative in that postmodernism encourages relative thinking. So, for example, Christianity says that Jesus Christ died and rose again. That is an absolute statement of fact from a biblical perspective. Postmodernism will say there is no ultimate truth. So, postmodernism is wrong. So, postmodernism is dangerous. But at the same time, postmodernism is a good challenge to modernism that tries to dominate against Christianity. Modernism that says all the knowledge that we know is science and that's all. Postmodernism can help to challenge that by saying that actually we can use science in a prejudicial way. We're not as objective as we make ourselves to be. So there's a subtle difference there with postmodernism. Be careful not to fall into the postmodern trap of relativism, but at the same time, be careful not to reject completely everything the postmodernists are saying, because underneath there are some nuances that actually can help you combat a dogmatic modernism that we've seen, for example, in the New Atheist. Just a little aside there for you. Okay, now we we've looked at we looked at a definition of preaching. We've looked at some educational models and we've given a, a critique of those models now we're going to go into some books on the art of preaching we're going to go into some books on the art of preaching first of all we're going to look at Butterick now Butterick's homiletics if you're an academic theologian uh, just an aside if you're a, a if you're a true academic theologian with a PhD and all the rest of it this is the creme de la creme book for an academic. I mean, this book is massive. Uh, from a pastor who's pastoring a church and preaching, this book, you don't need to read it. Yeah? I'm not being condescending there because this book is not biblical. It's just not biblical. End of. Simple as that. Yeah? But from an academic theological point of view, what Buttrick is doing is he's using Schleimacher's theology, which I don't agree with, and um, and he's using it to write. He wrote a massive tomb. Buttrick wrote a massive tomb on homiletics, how to preach using Schleimacher's thinking. So, if you from a theologian's point of view, it's a very interesting book. It's a massive work, and um, you will not get through that book very quickly because it's quite a heavy tomb of a book. Buttrick starts his book with a defense of language in the face of postmodernism. He notes that a child at the age of two has a linguistic explosion and develops a working knowledge <coughs> of 2,000 words which the child can use to relate to the world. Buttrick notes then that we need language and it is a miracle how we developed it. Language is also important because it helps people to have identity. Buttrick's book, Homiletics, page 11, page 18, and page 32, etc. <coughs> um, for Buttrick, preaching should involve that it that is, sorry, for Buttrick, preaching should, just a note, this issue about language, very, very important from a homiletic point of view and an academic point of view. If you're going to go into a theological institution, as a preacher, a pastor, and you're going to get a degree in theology or an MA in theology or a PhD in theology, 
you're going to come up this question of the, the philosophy of language and so Buttrick is helpful uh, in this area for Buttrick preaching should involve uh, models that is not arguments but language modes these modes must face tough questions like those that the dialectical theologians Bart and Bruner have asked the Buttrick experience is the preacher's weapon and not logic you see he's in the Schleiermacher camp here preaching does not uh, persuade but sets the gospel in lived experience Buttrick goes on to say that preachers are not born they are made oh no they're not bro they are born they also should start to explore symbols symbols are what people use to give themselves identity this being so preachers need to choose the right ones so people might develop the right identity a preacher must also realize modern man sees things from different points of view so a, a preaching style must shift in point of view in its modes also structure in points is no good instead he says the preacher should use sentences to indicate each connected moves these moves must be mimic human consciousness and have strong starts and conclusions but Buttrick moves on to develop his highly complex and stimulating model but completely unbiblical he believes the introduction of a sermon should focus on consciousness and bring hermeneutical orientation Buttrick questions the mighty acts of God's preaching style and he thinks this style has a mistaken idea of objective history well I think Buttrick is wrong here history of the Bible should be seen in the context of the social consciousness so says Buttrick and he tells us why in the following quote quote Buttrick the mighty acts of God may be viewed as a narrative structure in a social consciousness and Christ may be understood as a living symbol who transfers Christian social consciousness end of quote page 116 another quote page 123 quote so lived ex experience is, ne is neither objective event nor subjective effect as human beings in the world we manufacture uh, manufacture symbols which turn uh, often hold us captive and we comprehend ourselves via metaphor we act in metaphor we adapt social attitudes because of the metaphor end of quote then Buttrick goes on to consider illustrations they must have a clear analogy to an idea in a sermon images here must be used which imitate human consciousness human consciousness is being put in words through image metaphors are also good illustrations they should be used because they mimic consciousness uh, page 192 Buttrick Buttrick then moves on to style for him point of view determines style he advises the preacher to keep language concrete and use verbs as they create color and preaching says Buttrick must also have a strong emphasis on baptism as this is the church speaking sacramentally to the world he then notes there is a crisis in process and concepts of word and spirit and the authority of preaching the way forward here for Buttrick is to retreat to a gospel of consciousness and not historical facts and he advises that the place of preaching in the church and society is to speak between mystery and mystery hermeneutics is to be a mediator of the mystery of being in the world and knowing Christ through symbol preaching then from the Bible to modern man is finding common consciousness uh, in the Bible with today this is the pre to preach in a mode of consciousness finally Buttrick advocates a mode of immediacy which is to preach a story preachers do not tell a story as all language strictly speaking is performative what preachers are to do said Buttrick they are to medit mediate consciousness in hearing and reaching re uh, reacting Buttrick then gives advice on how to put on a sermon together that is the logic of a sermon will be a logic natural to the way more modern people put meaning together to connect with a congregation one must start with Christian consciousness profound ontological questions Buttrick gives this final summing up of his great book on homiletics with these words they illustrate the core info of which uh, represent Buttrick quote page 444 at the outset we argue that Christian preaching is a two-way hermeneutic concerned on the one hand with symbols of faith and on the other hand with the hermeneutic of situations any preaching will involve both now I just want to say here I completely disagree with Buttrick where he rejects historical truth Christianity is not about consciousness it's about historical facts it's about Christ coming and dying and rising again and a preacher must preach those facts so all this consciousness that Buttrick is talking about where he got it from Schleimacher is just not true 
And he's saying that we must mimic the way the mind works. Well, the way the mind works is an open question. I mean, if you look at Aristotle's work on, on uh, how to do public speaking, he gives a very good rendition of how the human mind works psychologically. So the question is, you know, even classical authors like Aristotle have more wiser things to say than a Butterick. So when Butterick's talking about how we learn and how we know, there are open questions about that because there are other theories and other ideas about how we know and the way we understand. The issue is, again, is whether Butterick and other theologians and homiletic writers will come down basically on the Word of God. This is the big issue, really. What Butterick is doing is saying, I come down on culture and human experience. But for a Christian, we come down on the Bible, we preach the Bible, we teach the Bible, and we try to get the Bible in the modern mind. And that's where every preacher should start. Now we're looking at Robinson's Expository Preaching, IVP, less than 1980. In his introductory remarks, Robinson makes the point in saying that God chose the preacher, the sermon and the audience, Acts 15.7. He points this out as an encouragement to the preacher that preaching should be fruitful. Let's turn to Acts 15.7. Let's get the word of God in here. It's always good to have the Word of God because that's what it's all about. Acts 15.7 So what I'm doing here, folks, uh, I'm trying to tackle preaching on an academic. This is for academics. I'm trying to really argue for biblical preaching. But by doing so, I have to go through all these academic people to show these academics that at the end of the day, what they're saying is nonsense. Let's get back to the Bible. So bear with me. Acts 15, verse 7. When there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while God made choice among us, but the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So he stands up, Peter, and he proclaims. He proclaims the word of God. This is my work and my research, by the way, folks. All this paper is what I've written and I've researched. In his introductory remark, this is Robinson. Robinson makes a point in saying that God chooses the preacher. Um, the sermon and the audience, Acts 15, 7. He points this out as an encouragement to the preacher that preaching will be fruitful. Robinson then goes on to say that the Apostle Paul did not see preaching as a discussion but as God challenging humanity to turn to the Creator. Preaching is to be done through the medium of the Bible. Amen. Robinson defines his method. Quote, expository preaching is the communication of a biblical concept derived from a transmitted through the historical, grammatical, and literary study of a passage in its context, which the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit first applies to the personality and experience of the preacher then through him to his ears, hearers, end of quote. I have to say this, by the way, that Robinson's book on expository preaching is, is a must for reading. Robinson now points out how often the preacher uses the Bible to expand his own agenda, when in fact the preacher should use the Bible as his main source of ideals. For Robinson, expository preaching must give efficient, under, sufficient understanding of truth as people's eternal destiny is at stake. An expositor must be a person who listens to God in order to preach God's message, and he then explains the mind of an expositor. Quote, an expositor thinks in three areas. First, as an exegete, he struggles with the meaning of the Bible, the biblical writer. Uh, Robinson's top, top man, Robinson. Then as a man of God, he wrestles with how God wants to change him personally. As a preacher, he ponders what God wants to say to his congregation. Robinson, page 20, 23, 20, 26. For Robinson, the sermon should be a bullet and not a bookshot. That is, he believes a sermon must have a single idea which hits its target. This is better than having a sermon with many ideas, but having it in no target. This one idea for a sermon comes by realizing that each idea has a complement and a subject. To get the big idea of a Bible text is a hard work. Definition of terms are then gone over, and Robinson defines complement as the answer to the question of, 
what exactly am I saying about what I'm talking about? Idea means the distillation of life that comes out of particulars and relates them to each other. Subject means the answer to the question, what am I talking about? The meat of Robertson's book is when he starts on how preaching begins. First, he suggests the preacher should choose a text. Second, the preacher should study the passage and gather notes. Lexicons and study aids will help get the context here. Third, relate the part of your notes so as to find the exegetical idea. After we have wrestled with the text, we must wrestle with the age we live in, and we must think hard about the question people ask today. He points out that the Bible will speak to the modern age and as the principles and problems of the Bible are similar to today. As the preacher constructs his sermon, it must have a definite shape and the shape will be di uh, dictated by explaining the text, prove your position, and then apply your principle. How does this work, says, say, in the narrative preaching? It is true you can use only one, is it true you can only use one idea? Quote, Robinson, quote, Page 124, narrative preaching, however, does not merely respect the detail of a story like recording a pointless uh, worn-out plea. Through the story, the preacher communicates ideas in a narrative sermon as in any other. Sermon as a major idea continues to be supported by other ideas, but the content support the points is drawn from the incidents in the story. End of quote. The process goes on by giving your sermon outline fresh, flesh. Robinson advises that the preacher should fill in the outline with supporting material. For example, explain, prove and apply or amplify the sermon points. This can be done further by restatement, explanation, definition, factual information, quotations, narrations and imagination. Also, this material should help the preacher to hit the same point he is trying to make and to hit that same point at least several times. Introductions must realize the audience is assess assessing us. Conclusions can end in summary quotations or questions. Finally, Robinson gives his final advice on style. Style should have short sentences, direct speech and vivid language. Preachers should realize the audience can spot if they are not constant, consistent. Body language must match our speech, for example, if a preacher is preaching on love, he must be loving. Preachers should also move about in the pulpit if congregations wanted to look at a statue, they would go on to a museum. Now, I think uh, Robinson's book is, is creme de la creme, basically. I mean, it is creme de la creme. You are missing out on a preacher if you don't read Robinson's book. It really is superb. Every preacher and pastor should have a read of that book. Excellent on hermeneutics, how you should study to get, your, uh, get into the Bible. Excellent material on how to form your message. Uh, yeah, superb book, absolutely superb. I would encourage people to... I, I don't have anything really bad to say. I've got a lot of critical notes here against Robinson to criticise him, but I don't want to do that today. I, I think um, he is well worthy of respect. Uh, any man or I've got out there, you need to read that book, excellent book, yeah. Now we're going to look at Lewis Inductive Preaching, Crossway Books, uh, which is to pay, uh, yeah, okay. Lewis begins his book by noting listeners today are not interested in using logic, but in using imagination or the right side of the brain. He believes that the average churchgoer secular, is secular-minded and has questions and problems the church best does not deal with. He believes that the first thing a preacher needs to do is not argue with the secular mind, but show a loving attitude. If the congregation sees the preacher cares, then they will listen. Today, he says, many of our hearers hunger for a listening, caring, loving preacher who relates to the people. Most congregations would rather see a sermon than hear one any day of the week, he says, end of quote. Lewis strongly advises that preachers should demonstrate that they are involved in people's lives. Lewis then goes on to point out why secular culture is in the way, the way it is. He thinks the media have played a large role in the process of secularization. For years, people have been watchdogs 
uh, watching TV and soaking up its anti-Christian attitudes. And modern Western culture has many paradoxes. It has much wealth, but lots of poverty. Expanded information on sex, but so in teenage pregnancy. More computers and less compassion. People feel a need for order and reason in this chaos, not Lewis. In this climate, people want common sense answers, answers that are practical down to earth. Lewis describes how people learn in this culture. Number one, listening, discussing. Number two, discussing. Number three, watching. Number four, inventing. Number five, thinking. Number six, remaking. Number seven, associating. Number eight, modeling. Number nine, attacking. Number ten, choosing. Number eleven, seeing. Number twelve, reading. And he makes his conclusions on the learning process as follows. Quote. Ongoing research by a psychologist and educational experts continue to enlighten us about human learning. Some of these researchers are now concluding that humans learn only by participating by involvement. They insist no one learns by being told what is learned must be anchored to our reality by experience. End of quote. Lewis then is advocating that a variety of learning styles is good for preaching. In the light of this, Lewis throws doubt on deductive preaching. Lewis believes that inductive method of preaching is best because it is less dogmatic and involves people in the learning process. How do you develop on inductive sermon? Lewis replies, use narrative people, love a story. If you tell a story, people will give attention to all, to, 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 what, to what you say. They will examine the characters. They will look behind the facts. There is emotional response will be strong. Another method to engage people is to as questions, parables are also helpful. Finally, analogy and dialogue, all these are methods to use in an inductive sermon. From here, Lewis gives his big defense on inductive preaching. It is a reasoning process which uses particular experiences to develop general concepts. He explains why he prefers this method as follows, quote, Even though the philosophers may scoff at induction as illogical, we believe in it as we believe in in our experience, in real life, concrete experience overshadows or our abstract logic, our inductive outweighs our deduction. Thus, we prefer a reasonable sermon to our outright abstract logic. <coughs> reasonable induction from experience <coughs> carries more clout for contemporary listeners than fail-safe propositions of any ivory tile mind. Induction, after all, is an old and trusted friend. <coughs> Excuse me. I'll quote him. Okay, we've been going on for an hour, and uh, we'll continue on Lewis and his idea uh, in five minutes. We're going to have a five-minute break, and I'm going to get myself a drink, and I'll be back in five minutes. So just have a rest, have a break, and we'll continue this uh, lecture. And uh, maybe if you want to split up in groups, um, and, and just discuss, maybe for five, ten minutes, um, what are you learning from this part of the lecture at the moment? Um, is there any area where you need to change in your, le in your preaching? Um, is there anything controversial that you disagree with? Um, these are some questions you can discuss, you can split up into groups. And discuss as preachers and uh, maybe have a look at Acts chapter 17 and read the whole chapter in your group and uh, discuss uh, what you've learned so far and discuss about Acts chapter 17 and think about um, what that chapter might teach you about preaching what how did Paul preach at Athens and what can we learn from his preaching uh, for today Okay, I'll leave you with that for five, ten minutes. Uh, I'll be back in five minutes, but you take longer if you want ten minutes, twenty minutes in your group, or even half an hour, come back, and then we'll carry the rest of the lecture. Okay. <laughs>
Excuse me. Excuse me. Hope everybody's okay out there. <coughs> Just seeing where we got up to. <coughs> 
okay folks <clears throat> hope you're okay today it's good to be with you and uh, we're continuing here and we'll continue on the lecture <laughs> That was uh, just a few thoughts there, okay. Excuse me. Lewis writes, deductive preaching starts with a declaration of intent and process to prove the validity of what the preacher says is already determined to be true. Inductive preaching, on the other hand, lays out evidence, the examples, the illustrations, and post postpones the declaration and assertions until the listeners have a chance to weigh the evidence, think through the implications, and then come to the conclusions with the preacher at the end of the sermon." End of quote. Lewis believes inductive preaching makes people's minds active and not receptive. In the passive sense, this kind of preaching reveals tolerance, charity, respect, trust, cooperation, and patience. It is a kind of preaching which says the listener can, can walk with me, I will try to deal with your questions, and there are some 17 positive attitudes which emanate from inductive preaching which Lewis wants the preacher to understand. Number one, accepting. Number two, accommodating. Number three, asking. Number four, beckoning. Number five, passion, compassionate number six cooperating, number seven courageous, number eight dialoguing, number nine directing, number ten encouraging, number eleven engaging, number twelve inquiring, number thirteen instructing, number fourteen evol involving, number fifteen probing, number seven sixteen respecting, number eight and <clears throat> sorry these attitudes enable the preacher to get the person to move in the direction the preacher wants to go, yet without being seen as authoritarian. Lewis believes it's pointless to argue against the need for inductive preaching. Experience-based learning has always been a part of culture. Can't use the method in science in uh, uh, meth use the method. Science in the 1600s used the method. Induction was used in the theories of French Revolution and educational institutions used it in the 20th century to challenge tradition, promote freedom, informality, group project learning along with individuality. Humanism has used the inductive method and the media. All this history notes, Lewis reveals there has been a shift from authority to experience in learning. Lewis is eager to show his model can stand uh, the test of homiletical theory and he points that Jesus and the Bible use the method. He notes that the Bible God does not start with the answer, instead he starts with the concrete before the abstract. More statements than in the Bible are built on experience and examples. In the teaching of Jesus we see the same thing. Jesus often used a story. Jesus often asked questions. He responded to people's questions. He goes where people are. Lewis then compares the Pharisees' deductive model of preaching with Jesus' inductive model. The Pharisees were theoretical. They had definition, they had tradition, they were abstract, authoritarian, impersonal. Jesus was practical, active on facts, inner feelings, experience and personal. Lewis then deals with the questions of how then do you develop an inductive sermon. Lewis points out an inductive sermon has a number of possible ingredients with various combinations. Example, common ground, number two, biographical material, three, narrative, four, knowledge, Number five, representative cases. Number six, questions. Number ten, dialogue. Number eight, biblical incidents. Number nine, conclusions. Number ten, evidence. These elements in Lewis' model, as far as he is concerned, of honesty and integrity. It is a transparent and open model as opposed to being closed and dogmatic. Lewis goes on to say that it is best to use experience and doctrine together. And many Baptist preachers have used these ideas and been successful. The process of the preaching starts by the preacher exposing himself to the questions people are asking and this is what the Baptist preacher did that the preacher is to survey 
the scriptures and then the preacher is to construct and review the material in the act of preaching the preacher should be direct the preacher <clears throat> the preacher's attitude must come across as helpful and he's a, he advocates extemper preaching here and in the preaching process you must realize people need to make a decision based on a attention b evaluation c recognition and d decision in this process information should seek to influence the right side of the brain he tells us here traditional homiletics for centuries has emphasized the left brain pattern of verbal analytical sequel appeals and is a downplayed appeals that would involve right brain functions such as memory imagination emotion relationships divergent thinking imaginary imaginary integrations of personal experience etc it's a book in the end of the day it's a book that has some interesting thoughts but it's not a book that I would recommend anyone to read as a preacher but certainly a book that you'd want to read from an academic point of view Adams preaching with purpose Baker book has Grand Rapids is the next model that we're looking at J. Adams starts with his book by criticizing traditional homiletics as scholastic the main point to remember for Adams here is that a sermon must have purpose he believes that preaching has two main types these are evangelistic and teaching and preaching a sermon has these elements one content two a preacher and number three an occasion number four listeners number five the Holy Spirit the job of homiletics is to remove all obstacles which inhibit preaching the truth Adam gives the mechanics of sermon preparation first the preacher must find the telos of a passage this can only be done if one realizes that the Holy Spirit has given a passage for specific purpose. His basic hermeneutical rule is that after the grammatical analysis, get at the telos of the passage. Tell it cues. Point to purpose here. After this work starts to look at the audience, counseling is one way of finding out the heartbeat of the people. If a preacher does this, his preaching can be proactive, that is, dealing with problems before they arise. The preacher must realize here he should expect change in the congregation. If he expects no change, then his preaching is more like lecturing. Adams then advises preachers to use an outline for preaching. This method gives precision and attention to detail. It also gives freedom in delivery. The actual form of the sermon does not rely on general rules as the Bible does not prescribe any. Having said this, the introduction must orient the listener. The conclusion should end with a new material, but with command clusters, preaching should have gospel content if not people will not know what to believe as for the main body of the sermon it should have a sense of appeal what he means is that a preacher should seek to arouse the people's emotions and to do it by these senses stories are an excellent medium to use the senses and the main body of the sermon must also aim to clarify truth this is achieved by making the truth concrete personalize it or make it memorable you could also show how the truth is practical to people's experience. And Adam strongly advises that scripture must not be used to illustrate points in a sermon. The reason being the Bible was written to make points, not illustrate them. Adam also advises that if a preacher cannot deliver the sermon properly, then the preacher needs to go and see an elocutionist. The style of the sermon is considered, and it should be a style that does not call attention to itself. Uh, finally, he believes it's wise for the preacher to prepare sermons well in advance. Months before is a good idea. Preaching should be proactive. That means seeing pastoral problems before they arise and dealing with them accordingly. Preaching should have lots of application. This is what most preachers fail to do. Last of all, preaching should be Christ-centered. Uh, Adam's book is a very good book. Um, very well written. Very wise in its advice. And yeah, I think it's a good book to get hold of. It's a good book to read. And I think uh, Jay Adams' um, book is a very, very good book. And I would advise you. I would advise you to um, read that book. Number five, uh, P. A. Uh, P. Adams. P. Adams speaking God's word. I. V. P. Lester. P. Adams warns of a pragmatic defense of preaching. He is zealous to give preaching a theological base. Hallelujah. For him to do this, he is conscious that intellectually he must clear the ground against those object to the Bible being used as the main authority in preaching. Isaiah 41.21 and Matthew 4.4. Let's look at Isaiah 
Isaiah 44:21. Remember these, O Jacob, Israel, thou art my servant, I inform thee, and thou art my servant, O Israel, thou shalt not be forgotten of me. Sorry, 41, 21. Produce your cause, saith the Lord, being, bring forth your strong reason, saith the king of Jacob. From Isaiah 41 and 21 and Matthew 4, 4, he gives a statement that the Bible is God's word. P. Adams is ever so careful to make sure he is not branded a Protestant scholastic. He does this by showing he has no rigid view of what he means by the Bible in God's word. He states there are propositions in the Bible, but also there are a variety of revelations. P. Adams is also eager to show that the Protestant view of the Bible has historical validity. Quote, as Bruce Wouter has shown, however, the notion that revelation includes verbal content has a, has a long history in the thought of the Christian church and indeed assumed to be true until fairly recently from Catholics to Quakers all have assumed that the revelations come in God's word, end of quote. Page 117, P. Adams. P. Adams continues to press the point about words. As the basis of revelation, he defends the position against the idea that God is so transcendent that God cannot reveal himself in words, as this is to, to limit God. He goes on to say that postmodernism reflects the Protestant view of the Bible, but that Protestants should not fear postmodernism as it is an attempt to make the universe meaningless, but also not to build on Jesus' word is not to build on the right foundation. P. Adam also argues that in the Lord Jesus life he used words to teach for example in preaching in synagogues public and private conversation he used words there are also practical reasons why Jesus used words it was partly because God's words are effective partly words reveal God's intention and God preserves his word for future generations so it is important to realize that Adams is arguing a theological basis for preaching in a theology of word, it is a definition that challenges neo-orthodox and modern liberals who find such concepts quite alien. P. Adams then goes on to discuss preaching in relation to the community. But Adams' preaching should not be seen in isolation from other ministries in the church. He has little time for the idea that only preaching is of importance in the local church. As for preaching tests, P. Adams has a number of things to say. He thinks preachers should preach. Number one, the content of scripture. Number two, the purpose of scripture. Number three, the use of scripture. Number four, the redeemer of scripture. Number five, biblical theology, that is to teach scripture as a whole. And P. Adams believes that arguments for expository preaching are more to do with pragmatism than what the Bible actually teaches. P. Adams believes that the best way to give uh, form in your sermon is to aim at different levels of hearers. For example, people who know little of the Bible need a simple structure. Those who know much need a sermon that is more demanding. P. Adams finishes book with the demands of preaching. A preacher is obedient to God. Second, a preacher should be obedient to God's truth. And then the preacher should know the case congregation. He must have love for the people and be willing to suffer for preaching truth. Some wise words there. Gilmore, preaching as theatre, essay and press, um, was not impressed by this book at all. Some of the um, clever academics out there might like this kind of stuff, but I don't like it, don't agree with it at all. Anyway, Gilmore, in uh, preaching as theatre, essay and press, London. Gilmore is a, is a man of the theatre, and he believes preaching should be similar to the theatre. He asks, why do people go to theatre? His reply, because they want to see something happen. People want an experience and the preacher should give it to them. The Bible is, Gil uh, is, the Bible is Gilmore's starting point. The reason for this is because the Christian community expects the Bible to be used. And using the Bible, one should stick to the prophetic tradition. This tradition is this because it is adaptable, specific, and aims at different levels. The prophetic tradition needed today 
Not Gilmore, because there is need for preachers who will speak to our times and not be silent. Gilmore explains in a little more detail. It's all a load of rubbish, this. It's just a postmodern diatribe, really. Anyhow, quote, a modern prophet is someone who is saying what the Bible prophet said, but in contemporary situation about which we, we care, it may be the preacher himself, a radio or television commentator or a program or a newspaper communist. Basically, he's just into the theatre, and he wants to use the theatre, so he tries to give it some theological reflection for that. But that's all it is. He goes, but what is the content of this prophetic style of preaching? Obviously, theatre. Gilmore thinks the preacher should use books like Hosea. Hosea has contemporary ring to it. The problems of that day, such as unfaithfulness of God's people, are the same today. And Gilmore thinks Bible stories are good. They have not Gilmore capacity to make things happen. Characters in stories can represent things, for example... Ahab, repression, the religious establishment, using stories is not easy, it is demanding in the exegetical task, so Gilmore thinks it is wise to do this kind of preaching once a month. Gilmore continues his concept, concept of preaching as theatre, he notes that theatre is a personal experience, if this is the case, then preachers should use this own experience, then Gilmore comes up with an interesting concept, that is silence in a sermon is effective. This lets people meditate and, and releases them from over-intellectualism. In silence, there is communication to experience, and God uses our feelings to communicate silence. The next issue Gilmore deals with is the use of literature. He believes literature mirrors life. This being so, the preacher should use literature. He then makes a remark which contradicts himself. He states that he would rather use this style of preaching, but reluctantly, he has to use the Bible. Gilmore then addresses the issues of keeping fresh and relevant as a preacher. He believes that a preacher should combine insights from the playwright and the liberation theology. He thinks preachers need to have constant movement in their sermons as society has changed its perceptions and the way it receives information. He explains a little more on the why a preacher should adapt the times he lives. Quote, even a cursory glance at the Western world towards the end of the 20th century suggests that patterns are changing, sermons tend to be getting shorter, people who are used to radio or television where the scene is constantly changing are much less disposed to sit still listening to a, a monologue for more than 20 minutes, however good the preacher is, end of quote. Gilmore goes on that the to say that the preacher must be careful not to be dogmatic. In fact, Gilmore strongly recommends that the preacher should teach people to realize there is more than one way to interpret the text. That is disastrous, by the way. Search for truth means that in the hermeneutical process, the preacher must give people the sense that needs to that it needs the community's reflection to understand the text. Also, in the hermeneutical test, the preacher must be aware that the text, church, and world will shape his interpretation. Indeed, it should do. And at the end of the day, the preacher should reinforce the idea of the possibility of multiple interpretations of the text. End of Gilmore. I completely disagree with that. Absolutely disagree. Um, there is a meaning to the text, and you've got to try and find that meaning. Um, so I don't uh, encourage his kind of hermeneutical hermeneutics. Have a read of Adolf Schlatter. Okay. Okay, we'll come into uh, the master's faculty. Okay, the master's faculty. The Master's Seminary is a theological institution run by John MacArthur and dedicated to produce expository preachers. It is a full book that they've written on preaching. Richard Mayhew, uh, in his article Rediscovering Expository Preaching, gives reasons why the kind of preaching should be used. Number one, it delivers God's message. Number two, it has scriptural authority. Number three, it magnifies God's word. And number four, it provides material it number five it develops biblical knowledge number six it helps people to think biblically 
Number seven, it gives people depth and understanding. Number eight, it deals with the hard text. Number nine, it deals with theological points. Ten, it stops preachers from getting in their hobby horses. And eleven, stops human ideas from infiltrating. Now, this master seminary book on expository preaching is called Rediscovering Expository Preaching by, by John MacArthur and Friends. It is one of the best books on preaching that you should get. Okay. In another article, James Stinzinger develops the history of expository preaching and does this to prove that expository preaching, if abandoned, brings havoc on the church. He points out that the reason the church had the Dark Ages in the time of the Middle Ages was because preaching was in decline. Brilliant point. J. Ruskup writes in his article on in this book on prayer and he makes the point that preaching is dependent on the power of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 1 to 5. This is the case, then one must pray for, pray for God's power. Totally agree with that. It's an important statement that many books on preaching have little or nothing about prayer. This is amazing when you consider how much Jesus prayed. Luke 3.21 uh, 24, 49, 51, Ruskup presses the point. The young preacher has been taught to lay out all his strength on the form, taste, and the beauty of his sermon, a mechanical and intellectual product. We have therefore, by cultivated people, and raised the clamor for talent instead of grace, eloquence instead of piety, rhetoric instead of revelation, reputation of brilliancy instead of holiness. End of quote. What a brilliant quote. Rossop also wrote another article on hermeneutics. This is one of the strongest features of the master's faculty. They put great stress on exegesis, that's studying of the text. Uh, the use of textual criticism, use of hermeneutical principles, use of exegesis, uh, looking for application. In this process, the preacher is to look for the context, the grammar, the word studies, always remembering to distinguish between the literal and the figurative interpretation. He advises the preacher, remember that when looking at a prophecy, the prophetic books have their own inbuilt interpretation. So the preacher has no need to experiment in wild speculation. Also, when you do interpret the Bible, remember to use it in the progressive revelation context. Excellent work, this book, and some excellent articles here. John MacArthur, what a great preacher he is, and uh, he says in his article, deals with the issue of being a man of God and a preacher. A preacher for him must be pure, 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 22, let's look at that. 2 Timothy chapter 2 2 Timothy chapter 2 Verse 22, flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, and charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So live a pure life. MacArthur says a preacher must be after, not have to be money. He should, be, should not be after money. He should not put a price on his ministry. A preacher should be humble, gentle, and free from uh, covetousness. The preacher must live what he preaches or he will be judged by God. The next article, MacArthur deals with the Spirit of God. He believes that studying the Bible is not just an intellectual task but a spiritual task. This means the preacher needs spiritual illumination or the aid of the Holy Spirit. And MacArthur makes this point strongly that intellectual comprehension, education, experience is not enough. You need the Holy Spirit. And then finally, Robert, Robert Thomas. Thomas gives more detail on exegesis that big theme of the faculty and he believes that preachers should avoid catchy cliches and he warns preachers against modern hermeneutical methods such as redaction criticism for him the text is fixed and can be interpreted systematic theology church history apologetics and um, homiletics exegesis biblical introduction biblical language hermeneutics etc should be used okay um, Okay, that was uh, the Master Seminary. Superb book, absolutely superb book uh, that, that you could read there on preaching. Every preacher should read the Master Seminary book on 
expository preaching. Now we're looking at Johnson's preaching to a postmodern world, IVP Leicester, 2001. An excellent book, and um, we're just going to have a look at what that book says. And um, okay, Johnson's book is a detailed response to postmodernism and how the preacher can do his job in this climate. He, pre he believes that a preacher should think like missionaries. He makes the point that most preachers, preachers do not realize how much even the church has become secularized. This being the case, the preacher cannot take anything for granted. He writes, so where modernity was cocky, postmodernity is anxious. Where modernity had all the answers, postmodernity is full of questions. Where modernity clung to certainty and truth, postmodernity viewed the world as relative and subjective. Postmodern people have not only devalued ideology and truth, uh, but likewise suspicious of those who claim to say, I know. Johnson then goes on to raise some of the characteristics of postmodernism, and these are as follows. Number one, they react to modernity, they reject objective truth, they are skeptical and suspicious of authority, they are looking for self identity, they blame modernity for problems, they search for the transcendent. They live in a media world, they engage in a knowing smile, they are on a quest for community, and they live in a very materialistic world. Johnson then compares in more detail modernity with post-modernity. Modernity has a romantic view of life, has purpose, design, hierarchy, word, completed work, analysis, depth, narrative, and transcendence. Post-modernity has an absurd view of life, as play, chance, anarchy, silence, process, participation, sur surface, anti-narrative, imminence. Johnson goes on to give a well thought out and detailed understanding of postmodern culture. For the postmodern tolerance is important. Tolerance gives equal power to all groups in society. But says Johnson, postmodernism will be increasingly intolerant of the church as they will be seen to have no loyalty to such a pious society. Postmoderns will glory in choice and simply opt out of church, which seems to restrict choice. This glorying in choice will have profound repercussions. Homosexuality will not be an issue, as bisexuality will be normal. Postmodernity notes Johnson is the bride of anarchy. People will refuse to be locked into one way of thinking, so they will pick and mix their faiths and ways of life. One of the beliefs that does stand out for postmoderns is nature. The postmodern will have an increased reverence for her. Quote, Keep in mind postmodernity search for what is beyond. For many people today, the only reality acceptance of the search is found in the forces of nature. For others, the search will involve a delving into mysticism, the occult, ancient cultic beliefs, witchcraft, as well as crystals, tarot cards, and astronomy, and chanting. End of quote. The other attributes of postmodernity is that it is uh, parasitic, that is, it feel, feeds off modernity. Johnson notes that this society has been let down by politicians and their broken homes and church, and all of whom have made big claims but have not delivered. This just makes postmoderns even more cynical, and they will have little time for the church. So, how does a preacher engage with such people as postmoderns? Johnson points out that postmoderns as a, as a, a, are an experience orientated people. Maybe preaching could start here, maybe the emphasis on experience in preaching is needed. If a preacher, for example, pinpoints the things that postmoderns enjoy and speak on these topics, then communication has started. This method of using experience is not new, it is used by educationalists. Quote, educationalist and theologian Roberta Hanstens confirms this is the adult learning. As adults grow, they learn to trust their own judgment and experience more and more, and they trust that they hear from others against their own samplings of reality. End of quote. Johnson, page 73. Johnson then moves on to saying this experience by a society also wants to connect with everyday life. To connect with these people, you must let them connect with you. This means let, let them see that you are part of life just like them. Johnson gives some practical tips which can help the preacher to get the listeners to relate to him. These are one, choosing carefully what you say, two, speak in positive language, three, admit your own weakness, four, 
don't go looking for a fight. Five, talk about Christ. And six, remember there are moral gray areas. Johnson goes on to say, people are weary of words. People are not interested in the question, is this faith true? But they are interested in authentic experiences. This being the case, the preaching of the past, which was more didactic, should be abandoned instead of preaching, which uses stories and appeals to their emotions, is going to be much more fruitful. Johnson is enthusiastic to press this point of li leaving behind the didactic element. Here is an example of what he says, quote, Just as didactic preaching served modernity well, emphasizing New Testament epistles, narr narrated preaching will resonate with postmodernism. Listeners, narrated preaching as well as first-person narrative in the preacher takes on the role of the Bible character as attempts to communicate the Bible story while maintaining the story firm, story form. Johnson strongly advises that our preachers do not adapt to the times when people will not really listen to us. At this period of history, Johnson notes there is no chance for people going to accept what the preacher has to say. What the preacher says will be questioned, and this means preachers must not come across as know-it-alls. They must leave room for a sense of mystery, that there are things which we just can't understand, and you should not preach dogmatically, but more dialogical. Uh, I don't fully agree with everything of Johnson, but I just want to say that it's a very good book in understanding postmodernism. Excellent book. Now, there's more I could say uh, on each of the books, and I've got a lot of academic notes where I crit critique each book, and I'm gonna I'm gonna leave all that stuff because it's just all uh, academic nonsense, really. Now the Vox report. I'm not going to mention much about the Vox report. Um, I'll just read a little bit about this from my own notes. The Vox report has tried to do what my lecture has been trying to do. That is to see how adults learn and see how the effects of preaching. The Vox report focuses on a wide range of models of cognitive development, multitude, multiple intelligences, and mentoring and coaching and group learning. The Vox report notes that there are two types of learning. One is the accumulative knowledge. This means taking in facts and the developing sophisticated conceptual understandings. This is the learning system of many undergraduates. Then there is the transformative concept of learning. This is a learning where a person changes at a deeper level. More appropriate for preaching and congregation mainly because it allows for a more dynamic effect of learning, which is taxonomy of learning. What this means is there is simply a dynamic of living with and in a sermon, a moving of the congregation and preacher, which needs to be taken into account. A good example here is transformative way of learning rather than accumulative is by a preacher who reveals to the congregation how he changes at a deeper level in his delivering of a sermon. The Vox report shows how even a preacher felt this kind of preaching was well received. Okay. Now, I could go for another hour or half an hour on the Vox report. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conclude. How does the Vox report relate? I think what it's saying is that there is a dynamic relation in learning from the speaker to the hearer there is that dynamic connection. If you know there is an emotional, social uh, connection, then if you know that's going on in your learning, then um, preaching from the Word of God is not a disadvantage because this learning, the way people learn, is by this dynamic relation between the preacher and the congregation, which would back up traditional preaching. Okay. Um, my conclusion is, that what we need is we need a balance of looking at what the Bible shows as preaching. You know, Jesus used parables. Uh, Paul used structure. So I think when we're looking at preaching, we should ask, what's the Bible actually say? Uh, secondly, it seems to me that biblical preaching...
uh, focuses on the truth of scripture a lot of these books that are being written today on preaching focuses on, on experience and what we should experience and how we experience um, but the, the Bible shows that we're to focus on truth and, and the gospel and biblical truth so a biblical preacher should preach the gospel and biblical truth um, a preacher should work hard in understanding the text uh, John MacArthur's group and Robinson uh, and others stress the need to study the text and and not to veer off on the Gilmore postmodern understanding of text that's not going to help you you need to go more in the direction of the master seminary of how to understand the text that is there is one understanding you've got to find that by studying the scripture so there's been a lot of emphasis on some of the books on exegesis how you study the scripture and the reason is they want you to be faithful to the Bible but I think a lot of these postmodern books that we can we looked at or their ideas they were sensitive to the way culture is and I think that we don't have to compromise biblical truth but it's helpful if we know where people are at and think about how we can teach the Bible and share the Bible preach the Bible in a way that connects with people and uh, I think that's the task now the uh, J Adams and the J Adams and uh, Robinson have the idea of having a point in your sermon that you've got one point and all the elements of the sermon point to that one point that you're trying to get across so for example if you get a nail and you want to bang it into the door you get a hammer and you bang 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 yeah you hit the nail into the door your sermon is you've got a point you might be say you've got to love God with all your heart that's your point everything should aim at ramming that one point home that's a good uh, point to remember okay I'll just go through some of the books that I've referenced today in this lecture if you want to go further into study I would encourage you to go to the master seminary website there you can listen to lectures on preaching I would also go to Southern Baptist Theological Seminary iTunes Reformed Theological Seminary iTunes and you will find and Covenant Theological Seminary iTunes and you will find courses there on preaching that will be a help to you but I would also go to preaching and preachers go there uh, do, uh, sorry Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones uh, website he's, he's dead now but if you go to his website you'll find a sermon series on preaching and preachers there that will help you to think about preaching uh, but books that are used here are J. Achille the Postmodern Bible Yale University Press J. Adams Preaching with Purpose Baker Book House, P. Adams Speaking God's Word IVP, H. Ardent The Portable Hannah Ardent Penguin Books, Carl Barth The Gottingen Dogmatics Volume 1 Erdman's, D. Buttrick Homiletics SEM Limited, Clowney Preachers as Pastor Preaching, M. P. M. Caphill Preaching with Spiritual Vigor Christian Forgus, J. Cask A Woman's Perspective on Preaching Foundry Press, R. Dabney Sacred Rhetoric, The Banner of Truth, J. Derrida, Writing and Difference, Routledge, P. Forsyth, Positive Preaching and the Modern Mind, Hodder and Storm, A. Gilmore, Preaching as Theatre, SE and Press, R. Gorman, The Faith Community, Mapping Christian Education, Aberdeen Press, D. Hart, The Ministry of the Word and the Limits of Christian Scholarship, What Happened to the Reformation, Presbyterian and Reform Publishing Company. Um, B. Hargaman, Introduction to the History of Psychology. G. Hughes, Why Christian Education and Not Secular Indoctrination, Thinking Biblically Crossword Books. J. Hall, What Prevents Christian Adults from Learning, SEM. G. Johnson, Preaching to a Postmodern World, IVP. M. Jones, Preaching and Preachers, Hodder and Stone. C. Jung, Memories and Dreams, Reflection. W. Kaiser, Preaching and Teaching from the Old Testament, Baker Academic Books. 
D. Kelly, Preaching with Power, The Bond of Truth, Edinburgh, 1992. D. Lane, Preach the Word of Evangelical Press, Herefordshire, 1986. R. Lewis, Inductive Preaching, Crossway Books. John MacArthur, The Spirit of God and Expository Preaching. Rediscovering Expository Preaching. E. Nagel, Karl Popper, The Concise Encyclopedia of Western Philosophy, London. F. Nietzsche, Beyond Good and Evil, Penguin. S. Olliot, Ministry Like the Master. J. Packer, Honoring the Written Word of God, Paternoster Press. J. Piper Brothers, We Are Not Professionals. D. Paulinson, A Flourishing of Flesh, Fresh Wisdom, The Call of the Hour and the Ministry of the Word, Whatever Happened to the Reformation, Prefetarian Publishing Company. R. Raymond, The God-Sent Preacher, God Preacher, Christian Focus. J. Ratzinger, Dogma and Preaching, Franciscan Herald Press. J. Ros Roskop, The Priority of Prayer and Expository Preaching in Rediscovering Expository Preaching, Word Publishing. H. Robinson, Expository Preaching, IVP. W. Sangster, The Craft of the Sermon, Epping with Press. W. Sangster, Power in Preaching, Epping with Press. D. Shipani, Educator for Social Transformation. Uh, J. Seymour, Approaches to Christian Education. D. Smart, Truth and Tolerance, Rutherford House. S. Stewart, Heralds of God, Hodder Sorton. G. Stevenson, The Vox Report, St. John's College. J. Stitzinger, History of Expository Preaching, Expository Preaching, um, Rediscovering Expository Preaching. J. Stott, I Believe in Preaching. John Stott, The Preacher's Portrait. R. Thomas, Exegesis and Expository Preaching, Word Publishing. D. Wells, No Place for Truth. P. White, The Effective Pastor. And R. Williams, Making a Difference, Balthazar, etc. Okay, that's my lecture on Biblical Preaching. And uh, I hope that's been a blessing to you. Um, many, many hours of research went into that lecture. And it's probably one of the most authoritative lectures you'll ever get on preaching because there we've looked at some uh, a variety of different books different models of preaching and um, will give you as a theologian and as a, an academic resources and you as a pastor to go away and think about uh, preaching and stuff like that okay we're going to close in prayer and I uh, hope this is a blessing to you Father God, we thank you for today and for your love and grace. And we give you the prayers and the glory today. And God, I pray that this lecture would bring you glory. And I pray many people would hear this lecture and be blessed and encouraged and challenged to think through the issues. And I pray that this lecture would raise up many, many preachers that are biblical and that proclaim the truth of your word. And so I ask this, Lord, in your name and for your glory. May this raise up an army of preachers may it help those who are biblical preachers to stay biblical and we ask this lord for your glory and honor so we commit everything to you lord in your name and for your glory amen amen god bless you and uh, i hope you found this lecture a blessing uh, take care and god bless